All right, well, good evening, everybody. Yeah, it's, it's on. I turned it on before. <laughs> What's, happening? What's happening, everybody? Welcome back to Victory Biker Church. And for those that don't know me, uh, my name is Pastor Chris. Uh, they call me Mouthpiece around here. Uh, for those watching online, we're going to start doing something a little different next week. Uh, so I want to let everybody know here that's here as well but this is going to affect more of the online people than it's going to the people that actually come here um, we're going to start doing the live stream at 6 30 instead of 6 uh, because one of the things that i feel like we're missing is a time of worship uh, we have tried to put worship in the beginning of our live stream and the, uh, the horrible people at the Facebook pages, uh, they keep pinging us for copyright infringement and told me if we do it again, we're not going to have a page on Facebook. So we stopped doing that. So then we started doing worship at the end. And it's kind of turned into more of a, a social gathering than it did pressing into a time with God. Um, <clears throat> and I feel like we need to have that that time that we get to press in with God. So <clears throat> we're going to move worship back to the beginning of our service. Uh, 20 minutes, maybe a half hour tops. Uh, but that way we'll start the live stream at 630. That way we don't get in trouble anymore uh, because I don't want to get in trouble. So thank you for your flexibility. We welcome yours. Anyways, today... We're going to finish up our series on Big Butts of the Bible. Uh, we've been talking about people that have had this encounter with Jesus, and as a result, their lives were changed forever. If, you've been, if you're visiting or if you're just tuning in for the first time online, uh, I highly recommend going back and watching this series. Uh, you can go to our Facebook page, which is Victory Biker Church Maine, or our YouTube channel, which is under the same name. So the first week, we talked about Bartimaeus, uh, our blind friend. Uh, I was blind, but now I see. Second week, we talked about Zacchaeus, who was the chief tax collector, and we learned that repentance plus restitution equals rejoicing. Last week, we talked about Saul, uh, and we talked about the power of a true encounter with Jesus. Well, today, uh, today we kind of start our Easter focus. Uh, all of the celebrations on the Christian calendar are celebrating something that, that God has done, signifying some sort of truth about who God is. And, you know, Easter might be the biggest celebration that is on the Christian calendar. It's kind of like the Super Bowl of our stuff. We're celebrating Jesus paying the price for our sins. We're celebrating his, his going to the cross and conquering sin, conquering death once and for all. But what is this tr what, what, what truth does this signify to us? Here's what I think it is. I think that the truth of Easter is that God chooses us. I want you to think about that for a minute, though, because God doesn't need us. He wants us, but He doesn't need us. He chooses us. He chose us from the very foundation of the world, and He chose that, that we were worth redeeming, that we were worth bringing back to Him again. Lots of people question their love, of, their love for God. I'm sorry, lots of people question the love of God. That's what I meant to say. People use all kinds of, they use excuses and they have all kinds of crazy ways to determine whether or not, does God really love me? You know, some people leave it completely up to chance. It's kind of like the, you know, does, he loves me. He loves me not used to do with the flowers when you were a kid. You know, it's kind of one of those things, you know, Here's hoping that God loves me. You know, other people, they leave it up to their feelings. 
And we all know how that goes. Um, they wake up, and if they feel the love of God today, they're ready to seize the day. But if they wake up and they don't feel that love of God, they want to put the blankets on, over their heads, and they're probably going to hide, and they're not really ready. They're just going to leave today alone. Maybe they'll feel it tomorrow. Some look to answered prayers as their litmus test. Uh, if I pray and God says yes, that must mean that he loves me because he's giving me what I want. But if the answer's no or if the answer's wait, nah, maybe God doesn't love me today. And you know, others go by circumstances um, and how it unfolds in their life. You know, they, they, they look at things that happen to them and if things go well, it's got to be because God loves me. But when life gets tough, when things go maybe not our way, maybe that means God's mad, God's mad at me. Or maybe he doesn't love me today. All of these things are crazy. Okay? But they all lack one thing. It's assurance. There's a Christian blogger named Nancy Missler, and she said... We need to have the assurance of his love in order to move ahead in our Christian walk. Not knowing if he loves us or not will hinder our being able to moment by moment surrender our wills and our lives to him and love others as he desires. Well, Easter proves God's unwavering love for us. Now here's a question for you guys. When did Jesus die for you? And I, I don't mean historically, we know Jesus died on Good Friday, uh, so we're, we're not looking for that. We're not looking for a date on a calendar. What I'm getting at here is, what were the circumstances around Jesus dying for you? Why Easter? Why did he have to die the way that he did? When, according to God, did Jesus die for you? What's that? That's true. So the circumstances surrounding this question lead us to the very heart of the Easter season. And it, it proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that God loves you and he loves me. So let's turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter 5. We're going to start there. Uh, we're going to spend most of our time in Romans 5 today. Uh, this is a letter that is written by none other than Paul. We heard Paul's story last week. Uh, this is a persecutor of Christians that turned evangelist. And he, this book gives us a look into the heart of God. For, for, it gives us a look into the heart of God for man specifically. And it presents us with a but statement that sums up the entirety of the redemption story. So let's jump into Romans chapter 5. We're going to start with verse 1. It says, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand, and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Now, I want you guys to notice a key phrase here, okay? Right in God's sight. Because of Jesus' death on the cross, everything changed. Everything is changed because of Jesus' death on the cross. Hope has been restored for those who choose to put their faith in Jesus. And Paul isn't referring to this subjective feeling here. You can feel better now about yourself. He's referring to this objective status in Christ. He's saying, if you put your faith in Jesus, things change. Life changes. Once we were separated from God, now he calls us friends. He calls us his children. He calls us heirs. 
Through Jesus, we have access to God. The separation between God and man has been completely removed. And we can come to His throne with confidence. Romans 5, 3 through 5, says, We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they have that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know dearly, we know how dearly God loves us. Because He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with His love. This is where people tend to get hung up. We here rejoice in our sufferings and we stop. We stop. You know, we don't want to do that. We don't want to suffer. Nor do we want to be happy in that suffering. Why would we want to do that? That doesn't make any sense. It goes against human nature. We're conditioned to see all suffering is bad. But what if it wasn't all bad? What if all suffering wasn't bad? This isn't saying rejoice because of suffering, it's saying rejoice in the midst of suffering. Christians, us, we have the ability to rejoice in suffering because we know the suffering isn't meaningless. God uses that suffering to mold us. He uses it to shape us. He uses it to strengthen us. He uses it to produce character in us that we may not have known that we had. He uses suffering to prepare us for all the things that He has planned for us. Now I know you might be thinking, how does this prove that God loves me? This is all setting up what we've got coming. I want to take you back to our original question. Original question. Back it up. Evidently, I didn't put a slide in there. Our original question was, when did Jesus die for you? Romans 5 and 6. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at the right time and died for us sinners. When did Jesus die for you? At just the right time. What we're celebrating this Easter season is that Christ came at just the right time. Jesus is coming. It's, it's the central event in history. And people can fight me on that. But it's the central event so much that even our calendar reflects it. Everything is B.C. before Christ. Or A.D. And a lot of people think A.D. stands for after death and it does not. Sorry. Nope. That's wrong. It's, uh, how do I say this? Eno Domini, which means the day of our Lord. So, all prior time looks forward to this moment. And all past time looks back at, I'm sorry, all future time looks back at this moment. Well, what makes the time that Jesus came the right time? And there's a lot of historical pieces to that puzzle, a lot of historical realities that that come into play which made it the right time, the perfect time for Jesus to come. It was a time of peace, even though it was peace through force. It was... There was a common language. Everybody spoke a common language. So it was really easy to get one message all the way through. There was an amazing systems of roads. So it was easy for them to travel around. It was the perfect time politically because Caesar deemed himself the son of God. Who wouldn't want to prove Caesar wrong? But it was also a time that was perfect spiritually. And what I want to spend the rest of our time tonight talking about 
is what made the right time right. It was the time of our deepest need. Romans 5, 7, and 8 says, Now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us when we were still sinners. I'm going to tell you the truth tonight, church. God could have sent Jesus anytime he wanted. But that's not what he did. He sent him at the right time. He sent him at the right time. Romans 5 and 8, which is considered the John 3, 16 of Paul's writings, uh, says, you know, it, God loved us so much that he sent Jesus in our time of our greatest need. When nothing but his death was going to help us. Let's face it, if, if Jesus is waiting for mankind to improve itself, he'd probably still be waiting. You know, if, if Jesus waited until we pulled ourselves together, until we learned to resist sin all on our own, if he waited for us to live perfectly, he never would have had to die for our sins. The whole purpose of the cross was to do for us what God knew we could never do for ourselves. Anyone here perfect? Anyone here not perfect? Very good. Okay, we've got hands. Awesome. <laughs> yes, you passed the test. But honestly, that's what the Easter season is about. That's what Easter is about. And I know I'm kind of talking about Easter a little bit early. But Easter is a big deal. Uh, that's what this is about. It's when we put our hope and our faith in Jesus, our hope in heaven is secure at that point because it's no longer based on us. It's no longer based on us. Because honestly, we're not going to get there in our own doing. We're going to get there because Jesus stands there with us and for us. And for those of you and those of us, those people that might be watching that think you might deserve heaven, let me remind you what God says. Okay? He says, we're helpless. We don't have the capacity for perfection in us. When sin was brought into this world, we received this sort of moral frailty, is I guess the best way to put that. It's, it became, we were powerless to resist sin. We, were, we became powerless to do what's right. It's a powerlessness to help ourselves. In Ephesians 2, it says that we're dead in our trespasses and we're dead in our sins. John 3 says we're unable to save ourselves. 2 Corinthians 4 says we are blinded by the God of this world to that we, can, we can't see the light of the gospel. Romans 3 says we don't naturally seek God. In our passage today, Romans 5, verse 6 says, we're ungodly, and Romans 5 and 8 says, we're sinners. This is who we are without Jesus. This is who we are without Jesus. You don't have to be a believer. You don't have to be religious. You don't have to have a Bible degree. You don't have to speak Christianese. You don't have to understand anything about the Bible to know the truth about yourself and the truth about me, and that is mankind is in great need. We're in great need, church. We're a hot mess. We ride the struggle bus. I drive the struggle bus. Okay? We make a mess out of things. If it's left to ourselves, we tend to self-destruct. So what's your hot mess? And I want you guys to think about this. I want you to really think about this for a minute. Uh, what's that place in your life 
that is just out of control, don't say your children. <laughs> but what's that place that's out of control in your life and you need God's intervention in it? And as you do that, I want you to know that you are not alone. We all struggle, but from the very beginning of time, Genesis 3, mankind has been rebelling against God. How's your heart towards God right now? Do you have a bad attitude towards God? Do you push Him to the side? Do you push Him out of your life? Do you have no desire to worship God? All those things might be true. All of those things might be true, but yet you're still here. You're still here. God is still offering you grace, and Jesus still died for you. And this just might be the right time for you. What else made this the right time for Jesus to come? Lost my button. Evidently, I don't have a slide there either. All right. It was the time that most demonstrated God's amazing love. Verses 8 and 9. But God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, He will certainly save us from God's condemnation. The worst time for mankind was the best time for God to demonstrate His unfailing love for us. If God loved us so much that He would only give His only Son, that He would do it at our... It proves that He loves us because He did it at our worst state. Okay, We begin to get a taste of the true the true depths of God's love because He sent His only Son when we were at our worst. He sent the thing that mattered most to people that really didn't deserve it. To demonstrate something means to show it, to prove it, or to establish it. God proved His love by offering us grace when we were at our most unlovable. Know any unlovable people? Yeah, I do too. That's the heart of our message today. I can tell you that God loves you until I'm blue in the face. I can scream it from the rooftops, but most people, most people, and I've heard this before, I've heard them say, Prove it, God. Prove that you love me. What we're talking about today, church, proves it. Proves that God loves us. It shows us the heart of God. To stare at the cross is to see the heart of God. To stare at the cross is to see the depths of God's love for us. To stare at the cross is to see the biggest butt in the Bible. Ah, I evidently left out a bunch of slides, guys. Sorry. I am a complete slacker when I, I, I did my slides last night. It was awful. But God shows us His great. But God showed His great love for us. That's the biggest butt. But God showed His love for us. This phrase, but God, it's one of my favorite phrases in the Bible. It, it's been the theme of this whole series, but it's also the theme of this book. But God. But God appears in the Bible 584 times. That's a lot. 584 times. And it's always bringing hope to the hopeless. It's always saving us from ourselves. But God. 
over and over and over again, we see that truth in this book. God loves us in spite of us. Psalm 73, 26. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And still, and since we have been made right in the sight of in God's sight, by the blood of, of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. Ephesians 2 and 4. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. That only leaves one thing that we can say at this point. And I've been waiting to say this this whole series. I like big butts. And I can, no, I'm, I can't do it. I can't do it. Can't do it. Not in church. Don will do it for us. No? Okay. Seriously, though. In all seriousness. Um, where would be, we be in this life if it wasn't for the grace of God? Where would we be? What would have happened to Adam and Eve? What would have happened to Moses? What would, what would have happened to King David? Or how about the robber that was on the cross next to Jesus? What would have happened to Saul or Zacchaeus or Bartimaeus, the man that was born blind? Where would we be without God's grace? Where would we be without the death of of Christ on the cross without the blood shed for our sin. The truth is, the truth is, God chooses us. God's love is never based on getting our act together. God's love is never based on anything that we do to deserve it. God's love is not based on our past track record or our performance. It's offered to us because he loves us. So I want to leave you tonight with a few practical takeaways from this sermon series. Note takers, I want you guys to write this stuff down. Jesus died for you when you were weak. Show compassion to those that are weak. Why is it that those of us that have been forgiven by Christ find it so difficult to forgive people? Yeah. Everybody got real serious there for a minute. You have to show grace, church. You have to show grace. You've been washed by the blood. The least you can do is show grace to other people. Whether it's a stranger on the street or the person you share your life with, show grace. The last thing I want to leave you with is this. Christ died for you when you were a sinner. Forgive those people that sin against you. If we don't forgive, how can we expect to be forgiven? Jesus came at the perfect time. He came when you needed him most. He came when you were the farthest away from him. He came just for you. He came for you when you were lost. He came for you when you were broken and when you were hurting. But God. This is the most amazing part of the gospel. Jesus doesn't force himself on us, church. He came to offer us eternal life in heaven and it is a choice. Each one of us gets to make that choice. You have every right to say no. 
but he came to pay the price for our sins and make a way back to God. What amazes me is how many people fail to choose him. Today, I want to give, I want to give you the opportunity. Uh, I, I get it. Faith is a big step. Faith is a huge step in our lives. We tend to compartmentalize it. We tend to, to kind of keep it very, very private. So many times I hear these excuses of why people can't put their faith in Jesus. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. You can't imagine the mistakes that I've made. There's no way God would love me, let alone forgive me for the things that I've done. But I'm here to tell you tonight that these things are all excuses, and they're all excuses that have come out of my mouth too. All of those things I have said one time or another. But they were all excuses. They were all excuses for me not pressing in and getting closer to the God that loves me, to the God that sent his son exactly when I needed him and changed me forever. The message of the cross is that God loved us so much that he sent his son to pay your debt way before you got cleaned up. If you feel like you're at your worst right now, <laughs> if you feel that you're at your worst right now, that in God's mind is the best time. That's the best time to come. God chooses you. Won't you choose him back? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. And tonight we choose you. Thank you for coming and thank you for giving us everything that you've given us. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to walk with you, to learn from you, just to have you in our lives as our Lord and Savior. Lord, we, we give you all of the glory and all of the honor because this isn't about us anymore. This is truly about you. And Lord, as we close out this series tonight, I, I really do pray that people, people have heard your word in these messages. Thank you for the radical changes of the people that are sitting here, the people that are watching online. Thank you for the radical changes in their lives. Thank you for making them where they used to be excuse makers. Now they're action takers for you. Thank you for that, Lord. Lord, as we get ready to, to worship you for a little while, we, we just want to lift you up. We want to lift up your name. and We ask that you become closer to us. Thank you, Lord for being here with us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.